First of all, people hate spiders, so you can't call a hero Spider-Man. You want him to be a teenager? Teenagers can only be sidekicks. And you want him to have personal problems? Stan, don't you know what a superhero is? They don't have personal problems. So many uh, stories and, and, and methods of storytelling and, and really left an indelible mark in, in American history, in my opinion. You know, a lot of people think about Stan Lee. They, they think about the, the editor or the guy on, in Stan's soapbox or maybe the, the older gentleman doing the cameos in the MCU and things like that. And I don't think a lot, enough people really talk about what a, a really good writer he actually was. To talk about this with me today is is someone who's who's old enough to have read Stan Lee in his prime, The Brain. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing well, Wes. How are you today? I'm doing excellent. You know, I, I asked you a few days ago, I said, hey, is there anything you'd like to talk about? The, the last conversations we had were, were really uh, illuminating, and I think people really enjoyed him. And you said, I want to talk about Stan Lee's Spider-Man. I said, damn straight. Let's talk about Stan Lee's Spider-Man. Although I will say this, I have read some of Stan Lee's Spider-Man, and it is a little bit different than, than the Spider-Man a lot of people are used to today. He's kind of a dick. <laughs> well, it depends on which version you, know, you read now. The early issues of Spider-Man, the first 38 to be exact, were a collaboration between Stan Lee and Steve Ditko. A lot of the personality that was shown by the Spider-Man character, Peter Parker, was Steve Ditko's input. I don't know how familiar people are with Steve Ditko other than what you've heard through the years, but he was a, he, you know, he was a disciple of Ayn Rand and kind of, you know, an objectivist. And he kind of injected that into his characters and he had enough control over Peter Parker to, he wanted him to be, you know, an isolationist didn't really, wasn't interested in Peter having friends or, you know, basically, you know, he wanted him to be a loner. And that was not really what Stan's you know, vision of his of Spider-Man was. I mean, he wanted Peter Parker to be relatable to a younger audience because you know a lot of the characters back then were adults that didn't seem to have any kind of problems. I mean, that was that was DC, you know, in its entirety. And Stan Lee's Marvel were presenting characters in a different light. And he didn't want he wanted a character to be the age of a sidekick, but not be a sidekick but he wanted people to be able to relate to him because that's the audience he was going after was high school and older. And that was where you know, Stan and Steve, you know, never quite saw eye to eye. And that probably has a lot to do with why Steve Ditko ended up leaving the book and Marvel after issue 38. You know, Steve Ditko has certainly has a, a place in the hall of fame of comics. He, you know, he created the design of Spider-Man and everything. But I'll be honest, I like Spider-Man with a little bit of the dickish edge off of him where he's a little bit more likable. You know, he can talk to girls, but maybe he's not super comfortable. You know, and uh, he's just the kid that always wants to do the right thing, but is always struggling to get it done. Absolutely. That, that's, a, that's a great way to put it. And, and that's what Stan, you know, wanted for him. Because, you know, we have... Uh, you know, I don't think Ditko even wanted Spider-Man or Peter Parker to graduate from high school. I think they even fought over that. So they, you know, Peter, you know, Stan now has Peter in college. He, he slowly makes friends and he actually even starts getting along with Flash Thompson a little bit. And, you know, before long, you've got Flash, Harry, Mary Jane, and Gwen. And what if you put a little thought into it, you realize... Stan Lee's basically, this is basically Archie. You know, <laughs> Peter Parker's Archie. Gwen and Mary Jane are Betty and Veronica. Veronica yeah. Flash is Reggie and Harry's Jughead. <laughs> and, you know, if you read you know, about those 20 issues, now they did have Flash go off to, you know, fight in the Vietnam War. But, you know, Betty and Veronica, I mean, Betty, Mary Jane and Gwen <laughs> kind of were the, the Marvel Universe's Betty and Veronica because they, they, kind of fought over him a little bit for about you know, 20 issues. And, you know, Stan eventually settled on Gwen. Actually, those are among my most, they're my favorite Spider-Man issues 
are from like 40 through 60 something because you have 42 they introduced you know mary jane they'd been teasing her going back to ditko and i have no idea what she would have looked like had ditko still been the artist when you know they did the reveal but w- with john ramita drawing her she was absolutely a bombshell i think they might have been patterned after ann margaret i could be wrong Probably. about that but i, I want to <laughs> say something like that but remember this was a lot of years ago but those those stories like i said you know, anybody that hasn't read those old stories, do yourself a favor and read them because they're, they, you know, the, the basic premises of the story still hold up and just like the, the way the, you know, relationships are built over time because they, you know, Stan believed in the slow burn. I mean, you know, it, it took 20 or 30 issues for Peter and Gwen to fully form their relationship. And while that's going on, you know, Spider-Man's, you know, still fighting his rogues gallery and, Things that happened in one issue actually mattered 10 issues later. And, you know, it's, it's, it's really fantastic stuff. And, you know, the Stan, you know, John Romita collaboration, you know, is to me one of the best in comics history because they stayed together for about 60 something issues and they're, they're wonderful. You know, one of the reasons I think Spider-Man um, had such longevity is, is the origin you know, I think that's one of the reasons that Batman really has had his longevity as well. He has a, a terrific origin that that provides a motivation and drives him forward to 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 grow and develop in time. And I think uh, Peter Parker has that as well as he's basically living with his aunt and uncle. His uncle's trying to teach him to be a, a good young man. You know, with great uh, power comes great responsibility. He makes a mistake. Basically, you could say that he caused his uncle's death. You know, he grieves for it, and he, but he. He takes that moment of, of, of failure to, to grow as, as, as a character and as a person and drive him to be the character that everyone loves today. What did you think about the, the origin that, that I believe Ditko and uh, Stan Lee created for him? I think it is it's the second greatest comic book origin behind only Batman's because it truly, I said, just the randomness of a guy running by Spider-Man in a studio and, you know, he's too full of himself to take the two seconds it would take to stop the guy and then to have it end up resulting in his uncle's death. I mean, it just, you know, that, that, that was brilliantly simple and, and it's, it still, you know, defines the character, you know, 50 plus years later. And unfortunately you are absolutely right about that. That's a, you know, character defining moment that Stan understood and some of the writers after him certainly understood. And most of today's writers don't because that, you know, they, they, when, when you see Spider-Man being treated as this just hipster doofus or so far you're removed from what Stan had envisioned. And you keep thinking back to what formed his character that that's that's etched in stone it would never he would never change who he is because he will spend the rest of his life atoning for something that he blames himself for and but you know, truly isn't his fault no it, it's just that was random happen. circumstance i mean but you you could certainly see where 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 a man of character would you know take that put that blame upon themselves and use that as a catalyst to be better and you know that's that's what that character did, and there's so many examples of that in the in the Stanley era of Spider-Man. You know, issue 33 comes to mind where he's trapped under a couple tons of metal, and he's trying to get to the you know, get to Aunt May with the medicine, and that's that to me that was the greatest issue Steve Ditko ever did. You know, the way he just spent like half the issue you know, summoning the resolve to get the weight off of him and. Yeah, the, those I said that 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 it's character a character defining moment. Absolutely, it, one of many again. And another and sure- thing that that I think uh, that makes Spider Man timeless, you know, it's it's the suit, it's the powers, it, you know, it's the personality being quippy and everything, but it's the stakes. The writers early on always knew to to make him a great character, he had to lose something every now and then. You know, early on it was Uncle Ben, but. You know, another really big moment, you know, obviously was the death of Gwen Stacy. And uh, 
for the courage and conviction of a writer to go that far and say, you know what? People love this character. They like the relationship. It's time to take it away and, and develop the character further and give him, you know, even more motivation and, and, and take him on a new path is brilliant. Yeah. That, that's, um, it's funny that that was done by a 22 year old Jerry Conway. And apparently the story goes when Stan Lee found out about it, he went something like what? He goes, <laughs> you bring him back now. <laughs> and <laughs> that's and they go, uh, well, Stan, we kind of can't do that. We kind of broke her neck. <laughs> he, apparently the, you know, he's just like, I don't care how you fix it. And then that's how we got the clone saga. But um, yeah, that's you know, apparently it was like, you know, we want to kill, we want to kill Gwen. Go ahead. Then he do it, and it's like you did what? It's like, yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> um, and I don't think, you know, I said, yeah, you know, did Conway will talk about that where he goes, I had no idea the Pandora's box I was opening because <laughs> I said, <laughs> so I mean, he, he got a little bit of hot water for that one. Holy shit! But you don't realize how young these guys were when they were writing this stuff. I mean, yeah. You know, if you ever get a chance to you know, read books on the early days of Marvel, these guys were barely out of their teens and, and writing comics that are considered great to this day. Um, but yeah, he, um, yeah, it's like, you know, why I need to do something to shake it up. And yeah, so yeah. And, and it wasn't just, it wasn't just Gwen. I mean, yeah, you know, the Spider-Man or Peter Parker's lost friends and loved ones. Yeah. I mean, remember George Stacy was killed in issue 90 so, I mean, you know, his, his life has just been one tragedy after another. Yeah, and, that, and that's why he's a he's such a great character. That's why, you know, the resolve of Peter Parker, of Spider-Man, that's why when you see him nowadays and he's just, he's a punchline, it just pisses you right off. You're like, oh, my God, did you have you not looked at who this character is and all the things he's been through? Do you think he would let himself be treated like that by now? How many times has he saved the world? Yeah. And again, you know, guys like, you know, Brian Michael Bendis just does not understand the character. Joe Casada does not understand the character. You look at someone like Miles Morales, Spider-Man, you know, Bendis' creation. I think he thinks the reason that Spider-Man is great is because of the costume and the name and the power set. He doesn't realize it's, it's the life experiences that the readers have gone through with the character and the things that you've seen him overcome that make him a great character. So when you have Miles Morales, you're like, well, I don't understand why he hasn't caught on. Well, you know, you're, you're reusing another character's name that causes a little bit of resentment, but you don't really see Miles have that, that kind of character arc and growth that you've seen from Peter. So it's harder for, for, for readers and audiences to connect with him like they have on a character with so much history and, uh, and so many great stories like Peter Parker. Well, yeah, the, the comics industry has changed. I mean, there's, there's no time to develop, you know, character arcs and backstories and character defining moments because comics is now just one event piled on top of another. And uh, couple that with the fact that even, you know, most of even what are considered, who are considered good writers today aren't, as good as the writers of 40 and 50 years ago that when you're not writing for the trades and you're not writing to hopefully be noticed by Hollywood and you're just doing it for the love of making comics. And this is the one, the one thing I will say in defense of modern writers, the old writers, you know, in like the sixties and seventies, it was just about the comic books because no one knew they were ever going to go any farther than the printed page. So they, you know, they were allowed to take, 20 30 issues to build things up you don't have that luxury anymore and i think that you know that might have something to do with why miles morales has never quite taken off and the others marvel has this belief and dc to a certain extent that characters are just mantles that anybody mm -hmm. can be anybody now as long as they you know throw on a mask throw on a costume and say you identify as spider-man we we hear writing for the trades a lot and i, I just discussed it um you know, in, in a video with Aaron Sparrow, and, and it, it really is is frustrating. It, it ruins the art. It ruins all, all the things that go into making a character great. I wish people would stop writing for trades and start writing for characters. Try to develop a character. Why is this happening to him? What are you trying to do with the character? The story is just the setting. 
but the, but what the character does and the way he grows, that's what is is going to be bring people in. It's the same thing, you know. I don't want to get into it, you know, with with Star Wars. People are like, oh, the reason Star Wars is great is because you're out of space and you have lightsabers and the music was great. That that was the cherry on top. The reason the Star Wars original trilogy is great is because the character growth, the character arcs. None of those characters were ever stagnant. They weren't just there to be a part of an amazing action scene. Everything was done for a reason. Luke Skywalker is inevitably changed step by step. Han Solo is changed step by step. Leia, you even see Princess Princess Leia is a different character by the end. And all those action pieces, they're, they're, those are just the settings that get them there. But it's it's the characters changing along the way that make the story, you know, last forever. Not to get too far off track, you know, Dan DiDio recently made an announcement that they're going to stop putting every story arc into trade you know, trade paperbacks and basically try to make the trades mean something again. If that happens, and if the rest of the industry follows suit, then maybe there's a chance that it might get a little better. But I think it, it, the industry's just changed too much to you know to hope for us to ever get the you know, one and done or the two issue story arcs. I mean, I you know, remember days of future past was two issues of X-Men. Imagine what that would be like today. Yeah. God, <laughs> God loves man kills. Just part of a novella. Uh, yeah. It would, God, good Lord. That would be like a 80 issue, you know, yeah, tie ins be, be a year <laughs> <laughs> to get through it all. You know what? Yeah. It's, it's crazy. I hadn't seen that from uh, Dan Didio, but I definitely want to check it out. And, and if that's true, kudos to Dan Didio. There's, how do you even differentiate what is great nowadays? Like, but you know, how do I know what was a great story back in the day? Because it was collected and it was printed out. It was it was seen as worthy as being released as a graphic novel because it was so important. You should be able to go and grab it and not have to go buy all the issues. Now everything's in trade. What's important? There's so many so many crappy stories that are just pumped out and printed out and, and they mean nothing. And it's just, it creates this huge signal to noise where you can't even see what's good anymore. It's the, everybody or, gets a trophy version of comic stories. And it also tells you what the industry thinks is good. What do they think is great? They think everything's great. You know, nothing is better than anything else. Yeah. Cause they, they all listen to that song from the first Lego movie. <laughs> everything I mean, everything is, is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we've deviated a little bit off course, but you know, I did <laughs> like starting out with with Stanley and Spider Man, some of the great things that he did, and why he was, uh, you know, paramount to the character's success, and and why his legacy in, in comics is much greater than as as one of the great uh, publishers or editors or one of the great ambassadors or you know one of the great cameo men for MCU history. You know, he started out as a writer. He loved the characters, and no one has a portfolio of created characters, iconic characters, quite like Stanley. Couldn't agree more. And that's yeah, he's yeah, he's definitely on my you know Mount Rushmore. And yeah, you know, someday we'll have to go a little bit more more in depth about yeah you know, Stan as a whole. But yeah, for for now I said, you know, his his contributions, I said you know, there'll never be another one like him. Absolutely. Second to none to anyone in the industry as, as far as um Love of the art, love of the medium, and and doing everything he could to make comics special and last forever. Absolutely. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. I would appreciate it very much. It helps us attract more views for the channel. Subscribe for future commentary, comic book news, and reviews. And don't forget to ring the bell for notifications. If you want to talk comics, movies, and much, much more, you can follow me on Twitter, at Wes underscore from underscore TC. With that, Salamat Poe. And I'm out.